Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. This week on the show, we're going to be speaking with Andre Grubacic. There's a bit of an introduction at the beginning of the interview, so I won't repeat it right now. For the hour, we speak about anarchism, the Yugoslav experiment, exile, world systems analysis, Rojava, his friend David Graeber, and other topics. If you're listening to the radio version, we suggest checking out the podcast on any streaming platform or at our website, which can be reached at tfsr.wtf, for a longer version, as well as links to works by Andre, David Graeber, and others, plus Sean Swain's weekly segment. You can also check the post for a transcription in the very near future and a booklet or zine version for easier sharing and reading coming up soon. As a quick follow-up to the episode that we did about protests against the homeless sweeps around the city of Asheville, the Asheville Police Department appears to be serving warrants to people for charges like felony dumping and aiding and abetting felony dumping in relation to the Aston Park protests on Christmas and other days when Asheville police arrested multiple journalists from the Asheville Blade as well as others present in the park or prior to the actual closing of the park for the evening. If you think this is bullshit and want to help, consider a donation to the Blue Ridge Anarchist Black Cross Bail and Legal Defense Fund via their Venmo at Blue Ridge ABC. You can also send funds to any of the Final Straw Radio's accounts, which can be found at tfsr.wtf slash support, as long as you mention ABC Bail in the comments. Thanks. All right, so I'm very pleased to welcome Andre Grubacic onto the show. Andre is a former teacher at the University of Rojava, a founding chair of anthropology and social change at the California Institute of Integral Studies author of books such as Don't Mourn, Balkanize, and most recently co-author of Living at the Edges of Capitalism, Adventures in Exile and Mutual Aid with Dennis O'Hearn. Andre is also the editor of the Journal of World Systems Research. Thank you so much for coming on to The Final Straw. It's my pleasure. Good to be here. Do you want to introduce yourself any further? I don't know, say a few words about yourself, your preferred gender pronouns, Any anything else? Uh, nothing really, no. I usually just say that I'm from Yugoslavia and... That suffices. <laughs> well, first up, I wondered if you could say some words about your identity as a Yugoslav, a, a nation that one cannot any longer find on a modern map. And if you could talk a little bit about the Yugoslav experiment and how you became an anarchist. This is why I don't like modern maps. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you are quite right. Unfortunately, the country is no longer in terms of the state, but Yugoslavia was always a little bit more than just a country, a little bit more than just a state. And I think you are quite right to say that it is an identity, an identity that is in a certain sense also a way of rejection or opposition to identities that were imposed onto us after the breakup of Yugoslavia. And the breakup of Yugoslavia, as many of your listeners probably know, was extremely violent and it happened in the 90s. And all of us who were, who grew up in Yugoslavia and who were actually Yugoslavs, who were identified as Yugoslavs and who identify uh, as Yugoslavs, we have found ourselves in what I call my first exile, which is the loss of the country that I loved. And uh, I still remember the moment when I was in Belgrade at the time, and my entire family is from Sarajevo, from what today is Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Belgrade is now capital of Serbia. It was the capital back then of Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, established in the end of the 40s. But the problem, of course, was I remember watching that, that footage of... Sarajevo being besieged and the civil war breaking in Sarajevo and it was absolutely heartbreaking and that's the moment when I realized in tears or through tears that I have lost something that was precious to me and something that was extremely important and something that informed uh, again I said I am thinking about this as my first exile second exile would be coming to United States also not my choice and not my first choice certainly 
and not something that I did quite willingly. But let me answer your question, I think, in a way that is probably more uh, informative for the listeners who are not familiar with Yugoslavia, or maybe even not familiar with anarchism. So uh, when I, I blame my anarchism on my grandmothers, two grandmothers, and both of them were communists. When they say communists, that for us meant people who believed either in Tito, who was the leader of Yugoslavia and who was the founder of what we might call Titoism or Titoist communism, which was a dominant form of communism in Yugoslavia. It was considered to be socialist self-management plus non-aligned movement as a political uh, orientation, external political orientation. And there was, of course, Stalinism, which was the opposition to Titoism, and my family was split. So half of my family were Titoist communists, the other half were closer to Stalin back in the days before 1948, which is a very important moment in Yugoslav history because that's the moment when the Yugoslav Communist Party is split. The majority of Yugoslav communists are basically saying no to Stalin, the famous historical no. And Yugoslavia is choosing its own way, its own path to socialism, which involved, again, uh, socialist self-management proclaimed in 1950 by a man named Edward Kardel, who wrote the first draft of what was to become socialist management, self-management, and which included many anarchist, guild socialist, and even Trotskyist components. And then, uh, of course, non-aligned movement, which part of my family was very involved with. And uh, they were building together with anti-colonial movements and states like Nasser's Egypt, a new perspective, new internationalist perspective, a new anti-colonial perspective that Yugoslavia was actually the founding state of the non-aligned movement. And the first conference was in Belgrade, 1961. So all of this is to say it was a very, it was a fascinating country uh, in which two, which one family had two different shades of communism. And my two grandmothers, the grandmother who was, shall we say, closer to the Stalinist side, but of course lost the faith in that form of bureaucratic socialism, was suffered a lot because of her choices. And I asked her at some point, what does she think and how does she feel about communism right now? And that was now a long time ago. I think I was 13 years old. And she told me, listen, I believe in communism. I will always believe in communism. I think the problem is that we have chosen, my generation, her generation, has chosen the wrong path. To communism and the responsibility of your generation is to find a new one not to give up on communism but to find a new path to communism and that you know left me uh, scratching my head and thinking what this different path can be and again i was 13 so i was still pretty innocent in the ways of the world and political ideology so uh this is where my second, my other grandmother came to help, and she gave me her favorite book, which was soon to become my favorite book, which is Alexander Ivanovich Herzen. It's, in English, it's called My Past and Thoughts. And My Past and Thoughts is Herzen's memoir in which he delineates and describes this fascinating history of the exiles, romantic exiles of 19th century, which included Bakunin. There was a famous, my favorite anecdote of Bakunin being chained to a wall somewhere in Russia, having to repent in front of the Tsar, but somehow escaping. And then he swam across frozen Volga, jumped on a ship, ended up in the United States, then Caribbean, then finally in London, where Herzen was waiting for him. And Herzen said, well, welcome, what are we going to do first? And Bakunin responded, well, do they have oysters in this place or do I need to go back to Siberia? And I <laughs> love that response. There was, you know, everything I was looking for was there. You know, you're 13 years old and you are just reading something like this and it's absolutely 
amazing. And uh, I said, well, okay, this man was an anarchist. So let me explore anarchism and let me see if this could be that other path to communism that my grandmother was actually referring to. And ever since then, I started reading things about anarchism and reading Noam Chomsky was very important. Uh, Noam Chomsky was extremely popular in Yugoslavia for different reasons and he was somebody who gave a qualified support to Yugoslav self-management and somebody who was translated and I also started translating Chomsky's books into Serbo-Croatian which was then the name of the language and uh, through Chomsky, through Daniel Gerhan and through my first anarchist mentor whose name was Trivo Injic who recently passed at the beginning of COVID, I learned uh, most important things about anarchism. Trivo used to say that anarchism is this noble attempt of trying to approximate or achieve freedom using the means of freedom itself. That was one of the ways that he was describing anarchism. And perhaps the most important thing that I learned from all three of them, so my early introduction into anarchism, my early mentors, my first mentors, Chomsky, Trivo and Daniel Gerhan, was an absolute distaste for any kind of political sectarianism. I have no patience for anarchist sectarians and I have no patience for sectarianism to begin with of any kind. And uh, I have even less patience for nationalism. And after the breakup of Yugoslavia, we were sort of forced to choose. And people have their own identities, nation state identities that I have chosen, identified with Serbs, Croatians, Montenegrins, Bosnians, Slovenes, Macedonians, believe it or not, these are all now independent states. But out of one, seven, we now have Kosovo as well. So basically, I refused to identify with any of those, and I became an anarchist, so man without a state, but also a Yugoslav, which means man without a nation. And Yugoslavia for me became a sort of a identity that I claimed with great pride for two reasons. One, because I was raised a Yugoslav. So the fact that Yugoslavia as a state doesn't exist anymore doesn't really concern me. But also Yugoslav in a sense of a political project. Yugoslavia was always a sort of a truncated version of something that in the region was known as Balkan federalism. And Balkan federalism, which was inspired by the ideas of Serbian socialist Svetozar Marković, a number of Greek and Romanian and Bulgarian friends of his, in 1871 and after that, was this idea of not a federation of states, but of a regional federation that was horizontal, that was stateless, and that was built on agricultural and working units of working people, most notably on something that was called Zadruga, which is the village commune, and Obstrina, which would be a sort of a village administrative unit. So, similar to Chernyshevsky in Russia, similar to Russian populists and also later anarchists, we were, we were talking about things and we were thinking about things that were not related to capitalist forms of organization of life, but we were actually referring to something that predates, negates, and to a certain extent escapes relations of capital and the state, which led me to my preoccupation with what in time I started or begin to call exilic spaces, spaces of escape from capitalist modernity, spaces that escape as a concentrated spatial forms of mutual aid, uh, which is a nod to Pyotr Kropotkin, famous anarcho-communist, uh, spaces that escape, at least to an extent, relations of capital, capitalist law of value, and also of regulations and regulative pressures of the state, especially of the modern capitalist nation state, which led me eventually to embrace both systems analysis and different other ways of looking to avoid methodological nationalism 
and state fixation in social sciences and conventional social science. So at the point when I actually had to leave, what at that time was, I believe, Serbia and Montenegro, the name of the country kept changing as the counter-revolution was progressing after the war, neoliberal right-wing counter-revolution. Serbia and Montenegro, I think, was the country that I had to leave and I was forced to leave because I couldn't find any employment. I was a young historian who was perhaps a little bit too outspoken politically. So Chomsky brought me to the United States. He became my PhD supervisor and he introduced me to a man whose name is Emmanuel Wallerstein. And I'm uh, forever grateful to two of them because they brought me to a place called Fennan Brodell Center, which is in upstate New York, which was a place where I was allowed to participate in research working groups and in something that was an extraordinary experience of collective work and thinking politically about limits and limitations of social science and the ideas of social science that would be completely different than whatever it is that we have right now. And I don't know how much you want me to go into that or if you would like me to talk about something else. But that is, again, back to 13 years when I was 13 years old. That was the beginning of my love affair with anarchism, which is still ongoing. And with my absolute dedication to the anarchist cause which I identified with democracy very early on and this idea of prefigurative attempt and notion of prefiguration or anticipation, anticipatory politics, which for me was very important and which I was able to find already in Chernyshevsky, in which you have to enact in the present the kind of the future you would like to see and you have to, and I think this is a quote from Rudolf Rocker, another important anarcho-syndicalist, you have to build the facts of the future in the present. That is what I think the most important thing about anarchism as a theory and practice of self-management, which is another way that I would refer or maybe even define anarchism as a theory of organization more than just an attitude anti-authoritarian perspective on things. Thank you. That was a great answer. I, I do want to talk more about what values you found and sort of like give an explanation to the audience what, and me, <laughs> what world systems analysis is as, as a framework. But I had a couple of questions about your experience at the time in the Balkans, in Yugoslavia and former Yugoslavia. I'd love to hear if you had difficulty as you were coming up finding material about anarchism. If there was a place in the sort of genealogy of the development of the socialism that the government imposed or that was provided around you to say like, oh yeah, people like Kropotkin were deeply influential, but they were idealists. But, you know, here we follow the materialist trend. And also a guest that we had on the show a few weeks back who lives in Belgrade spoke very briefly about sort of difficulties of organizing now in the Balkans, in former Yugoslavia, um, because of the rise of ethnic nationalisms, the, the impositions of those sorts of things. But also that like any sort of like leftist philosophy can be looked at by many people as polluted. And th this is like today, currently, being a leftist and trying to organize around labor or around mutual aid or these sorts of things has sort of a sharpness to it that a lot of people, you know, refuse upon sight. And I, I wonder if the NATO contribution to the war that was in the Balkans at the time, the neoliberal approach has been to claim that forces like the United States government are bringing democracy when they're dropping bombs and what they bring is a, is a neoliberal model of capitalist management as opposed to democracy. So I wonder also if the term democracy you've found is a bit like tainted or polluted or they have to fight for a meaning of it. Oh, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, may I ask who was the guest from Belgrade? Uh, uh, place? Yeah. Well, the name that he used on the show was Marco and he's currently involved in the anarcho syndicalist initiative of the IAT IWA in Belgrade, but he didn't give a last name. Yes. So 
the situation is, and the, the way I think your questions are really interesting, and they, they do make me think. Uh, back in Yugoslavia, and this is a very important, I think, uh, thing to mention. It was a very different world than the one of the Soviet uh, communism. Soviet communism was in, say, Romania, Bulgaria. It was different in Romania than it was Bulgaria, and different than in Russia and other parts of the Soviet communist universe. But basically, these countries were called the second world countries. I don't know if you remember the, that first world countries were countries of freedom and, as you say, democracy of a particular kind. Second world was the name given to those countries that were part of the immediate Soviet sphere of influence. And then the third world, which funnily enough, a European country, or at least geographically European country like Yugoslavia, was a part of. Third world was the world of non-aligned countries, countries that were neither West in terms of liberal democracy, nor East in terms of, or the second world, I guess, in terms of uh, what was known to be communism, mistakenly, of course, but still countries of real socialism. Now, Yugoslavia was different, and Yugoslavia had much more space for liberal, uh, for dissident, for all sorts of activities that were not completely, or not at all, in accord with the state, with diktats of the state, but were tolerated for many different reasons. So in Yugoslavia, there was always a sort of a coexistence of bureaucracy, we used to call it red bureaucracy, and the new bureaucratic class. This is popularized by Milovan Gilas, one of the Yugoslav early dissidents. Not my favorite figure by any means, but it's in a useful, useful way of thinking about a new red bureaucracy and an emerging class that assumed power in Yugoslavia, including, of course, members and higher-ups of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia or the League of Communists of Yugoslavia. That was the later name that was used after the reconstruction construction of the party after 1948, but there was a significant space outside and counterbalance of dissidents. One of mo most important parts, and I don't know if Marco spoke about this, of that dissidency was a group known as Praxis Network. And Praxis was a humanist Marxist or Marxist humanist, or I would say libertarian Marxist group that organized Kortula School. Kortula is an island in Croatia. And Kortula and School and Praxis Journal published all the important names, significant names of what is what became known as the Western Marxism. The term Western Marxism was popularized in Germany in the 70s. It builds upon the idea of the school known as the New Reading of Marx. These are Adorno's students, but also Eastern Europeans, like one, especially one who was very important for me, Karel Kosik. Some people who were in the United States, like Karl Korsch, that you probably know as libertarian Marxists or in council, council communists, and many of the people who became known uh, as important names of the new left, like Herbert Marcuse, who was coming fairly often, and many others. So all of them participated in Praxis. And Praxis was uh, just a fantastic critique of Yugoslav bureaucracy, providing space for all sorts of possible reinventions and reinterpretations of uh, Marxism of the, we, that was practiced and that was cherished and uh, imposed, implemented in many ways in socialist Yugoslavia. So they were all insisting on the partial success and partial failure of the Yugoslav self-management system. They were all in favor of self-management, but they provided very important and very nuanced, intelligent critique. People like who are today famous, like Slavoj Žižek, for example, who was never a part of Praxis, but he gravitated around it, was in Slovenia, and he was latching on to the Lacani 
Germany an interpretation of socialism. So he was looking more into France. Many people in Croatia were looking to Germany and German interpretations, Freudian Marxism and other things. There were plenty of space for ideological and very creative ideological engagement, which ended in 1968 when eight of these professors, including my friend Trivo Injic, whom I mentioned, was my first mentor, uh, were fired from the University of Belgrade and punished rather severely for disagreeing with the Titoist, the official, the bureaucratic party line. And that in many ways was the beginning of the decline of Yugoslavia. Now, many of the people who participate in praxis were also favorable to anarchism because they were looking for different ways to reinvent, to reinvigorate Yugoslav self-management, which was an alliance of self-managed economy and state. So it was something that anarchists who were the pioneers of thinking about self-management, Proudhon is probably the first person who wrote cogently and coherently about self-management, known also as the father of self-management. He never imagined it coexisting with a political state, let alone one run by people who were Bolshevik, so, or Titoist. So this was an uncomfortable marriage, shall we say, alliance. And in that particular political space, interventions were made to introduce anarchism, left libertarian thought, libertarian socialist thought. As you probably know, in most of the world, we use the term libertarian to talk about anarchism. There is no idea of right-wing libertarianism doesn't exist. So when we say libertarian, we actually mean anarchists. And one of the groups that I was a member of was called Belgrade Libertarian Group. And these were mostly people who were the left wing of praxis. And these were the people who were interested in this libertarian reinterpretation, not only of Marxism, but promoting anarchism as a possible way of solving some of those deficiencies. So out of this group, out of this milieu, out of this political space came many translations of, say, Kropotkin. Kropotkin's Mutual Aid, Memoirs of Revolutionary and other books were translated, and this now sounds a little bit ridiculous, but by a man who is the former neoliberal minister or prime minister of Yugoslavia, Zoran Djindjic. There was a time in the life of Zoran Djindjic, himself assassinated by mafia and by different other elements of the, we used to call them dual power, the dual power in, in Serbia after 2000 and 2000 and 2001 was really mafia and the organized crime. They assassinated the prime minister who was in his youthful days an anarchist translating uh, parts of Kropotkin and even entire books of Kropotkin. So we have a number of younger people who identified with a libertarian uh, tendency within socialism. And some of them, again, will later come to power and would become very important parts of the establishment. Even my mentor, Trivo Injic, became the ambassador. He was an anarchist ambassador, an anarchist who was an ambassador in Spain. So, that was an in Spain. in Spain, yeah. That must have been a very difficult thing to deal with the Francoist regime, or was this post Franco? Oh, this was post Franco. Okay. And the reason why he was given Spain was not only because he spoke Spanish, but because he was somebody who was developing within praxis network and within this libertarian space, political space, relationships with Spanish anarchists and relationship also with Latin American libertarian movements. So the Trivo was the first one who actually told me about the Yugoslav Kardel while composing this new program that became known as Yugoslav Self-Management was consulting anarcho-syndicalist texts and reading the Santidan and many other people who were anarcho-syndicalists and who were thinking about self-management, including Proudhon. So it was an uncomfortable task for the father of Yugoslav self-management to have to relate to the father of anarchist self-management and try to call him a Leninist or a Marxist or try to somehow reinterpret this in a Leninist key.
In any case, these were uh, the strange spaces and strange times of Yugoslavia, which was very, again, very different, had very different political culture, much less suffocating, much more open than the culture of other socialist states. We were watching American movies and Soviet movies. We were uh, delighting in Czechoslovakian cinematography and beautiful movies that they had. And film culture, there was a whole thing called Prague School, and many Yugoslav directors in those days went there and learned their craft in Prague, including Emir Kusturica, Markovic, many others. And uh, uh, Living Theatre, I remember, used to come uh, quite often to Yugoslavia, anarchist theatre formation from New York, who had actually, they were much more popular in Yugoslavia than they were in the United States at the time. So Yugoslavia was a very interesting open political space, of course contradictory because of the presence of the Communist Party, because of the elements of state violence, which we cannot ignore, but there were many interesting elements there that allowed for the development of that political space that Marco was referring to. These, well, we bought, your original question was about anarchist literature, which was we could find without problems. I remember um, absolutely delighted reading Camus, Albert Camus, and his book The Rebel, which was also very important in those formative days, and of course other anarchist literature which existed. Some of this was Marxist takes, like biographies of Bakunin, but you know, you could read against the grain, and you could read in a certain sense and discover many different things about the anarchist tradition by reading the Marxist critique. And again, there were books by actual anarchists published and translated. So Yugoslavia in that sense was unusual, different, and uh, very, for me, uh, the space where you could actually learn a lot about Marxism. Marxism was something that I had in my elementary school. Marxism was a class that I had mm -hmm. to take in elementary school, and I had Marxism in high school. And then I had Marxism at the university. And now, of course, that particular kind of Marxism that we were, we were, you, we, we had to, to learn was what I came to call in time right wing Marxism. That was the Marxism that begins with the Second International, Germany, de develops further by the, another right wing deviation in the history of Marxism, which is Lenin and Bolshevism, and then goes to Tito, Mao, and other people who, in the third world mostly, who develop it further. And uh, that was an interesting experience. Of course, it made me distaste, you know, it made me dislike Marxism a great deal. But I was able to find out books, and especially because I was, you know, trained as a historian, I was able to discover the wonderful world of British Marxism, of British Marxist historians. So I was able to read E.P. Thompson, who was translated, mm -hmm. of course, and Eric Hobsbawm. And, uh, but it's more than Eric Hobsbawm, whom I would not call the historian from below. He was a British Marxist historian, but not exactly a historian from below. E.P. Thompson and Christopher Hill were really important. And when I was reading two of them, I, this is all that I wanted to do. Back in those days, I was thinking about writing a history from below, and my first published um, academic uh, work was actually related to history from below of the Anabaptists who oh, left nice. the first communists, right? The people who said, omnia sunt communia, everything belongs to everyone, and created this beautiful communist experiment in Münster for which they were punished severely, tortured, and caged in the city of Münster, which still has cages of, as a macabre monument to the... Uh, killed, uh, assassinated, tortured Anabaptists. So I was trying to trace the movement of Anabaptists from Germany to the Balkans and to see where did they left because they were fleeing the oppression. And it was a fascinating thing. And in those days, I was very skeptical of Fernand Brodel, who was the historian famous for a historical structuralist approach or maybe... Particular. Is that the Annals school? Hmm? The Annals. Absolutely, yeah. yes. He was the, the third great ana analyst. 
the first was Rishi and Favor and Mark Bloch, and then the third one, the editor of the Annal, was Fernand Brodel. And they, you know, created something called Total History, which was a perspective that was relatively popular in Yugoslavia in those days. But I, I, I just wanted to study pirates and Anabaptists and runaway slaves. And, you know, I was interested in innate agency and resistance and all of that. And only later, I will discover Fernand Brodel after moving to Fernand Brodel Center in upstate New York in uh, Binghamton University, State University of New York. And Binghamton, I think, is the full name. And uh, this is where Emmanuel Wallerstein was a director. And through Emmanuel Wallerstein, but especially through the very first recruit of the Fernand Brodel Center and Emmanuel used to recruit people, both historians, sociologists, social scientists, and students. So both professors and students were recruited by him in a certain sense. I was probably his last recruit. I don't think that anybody came after me. Uh, I think the, the center is now closed. But I met Dale Tomich, who was the first person that Emmanuel recruited. And through my relationship with Dale, even more than with Emmanuel, I learned how to appreciate Brodel. And I moved away from E.P. Thompson and Christopher Hill and Peter Limbo and Marcus Redeker and all of those historians of resistance or historians from below. And I started to develop my own Brodelian history and my own Brodelian approach to history. Now, your question had another part, which was about the difficulties of organizing in former Yugoslavia or what now I still insist on calling the Yugoslav political space. <laughs> Because of NATO bombing, NATO bombing concerned two countries. Uh, one was Bosnia, where Bosnian Serbs were bombed. Uh, the other place was Serbia, where um, I myself was bombed by the American NATO forces in 1999. It wasn't pleasant, and it definitely left an extremely uh, difficult wound not only in terms of psychology and trauma and all of that, that definitely was the case for the, those of us who had to suffer through that, but in terms of how do you organize in the midst of all of this. The nationalism in Serbia is not something, ethnic nationalism is not something that begins with NATO bombing. I think the great counter-revolution, as I call it, started really in the 80s, and especially at the end of the 80s, and then with Yugoslav civil war in the 90s. And Serbian nationalism, which is important because in those days I was in Serbia, and I assume so was Marko, uh, created important limitations in being able to actually speak about any kind of leftist politics. So speaking about leftist politics in face of either neoliberal capitalism or neoliberal modernization, which was becoming a new doxa, or Serbian ethnic nationalism, which was its alternative, oppositional, and I would say symbiotic political option. They were complementary in many ways, although it sounds counterintuitive. These were the, you know, huge conceptual blocks blocking the horizon of possibility of creating a new politics of emancipation. And anarchism, which was, again, it had its moment and there was a possibility for actually articulating the, the new perspective that would be libertarian and that would be anarchist. It was really hard. And I, I, I think that many of us made a mistake of uh, not doing more to push for the anti-authoritarian socialist option in those days. However, it was really hard. I mean, you have to think about Serbian nationalists, paramilitaries, the war is over. There is the people coming back from the war. There's a lot of street fighting. There is a lot of violence everywhere. Mafia organized crime is basically running the country in uh, relationship, very intimate relationship, not only with political structures, but also with the ever powerful secret police in Serbia. And the countries, other countries of former Yugoslavia suffered a very similar faith. So 
it was really hard to fight for anarchism or any other kind of genuine leftist idea back in those days. And I'm referring to the end of the 90s, beginning of 2000s. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. I'm going to make those pompous academics regret kicking out such a genius. Deciding to build my lab and do my research. The Time Talks Podcast. Have you ever stared at a 500-page book and wish you could just talk to the author about their ideas instead? If so, the Time Talks Podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network, is for you where we discuss history, politics, music, and art with an anti-authoritarian and anarchist perspective. The Time Talks Podcast. What's this light? I feel different. The Time Talks Podcast. This is the Final Straw Radio, and you're listening to our conversation with author, activist, and editor of the Journal of World Systems Research, Andre Grubacic. So, Switching gears a little bit, you're currently the editor of the Journal of World Systems Research. We haven't talked about world systems analysis on the show before, so I wonder if you could give us an introduction to the framework of what it is, uh, how its approach relates to internationalists or intercommunalist anti-capitalist struggle in and beyond academia. Well, that's an interesting question in terms of relationship, and I think underexplored one, a relationship between anarchism and world systems analysis. You know, uh, there is the new issue of the Journal of World Systems Research will feature a special issue dedicated to non-state, anti-statist and anarchist movement in the capitalist world economy, wow. in the modern world system. But let me... Let me try to explain what was so useful, uh, for me at least, in terms of thinking about political ideologies and ideas within that framework. Emmanuel was, and you can see this in the four volumes of his book, Modern World System, but also in many other books where he was popularizing or making more accessible all the historical arguments are very dense that he made in those main books, four volumes. Now, the important thing for me was that Emmanuel was talking about 500 years of capitalism, 500 years of what he called capitalist world economy or capitalist world system, a historical social system that had its own, and this is an important term, geoculture. And that geoculture, meaning a dominant, hegemonic idea or constellation of ideas, he called it centrist liberalism. And it basically, all of it begins with the end of or with the French Revolution, which introduced something completely new in the world. And that novelty was called social change. Namely, before uh, the French Revolution, the idea that change is possible, change is normal, change is even something that is good, has been universally rejected by traditional monarchistic, monarchist way of thinking about the way that the world works and the way that history moves. So with the dangerous classes, as Emmanuel called them, of the French Revolution, this is the first moment when really the ruling classes, people in power, had to deal with dangerous classes and they had to somehow respond to this great pressure coming from below that was felt all the way to Haiti. And Haitian revolution is very much part of the French revolutionary experience. Usually you don't learn about Haitian revolution in American universities or high schools, which I had to learn when I moved here. But uh, the thing about this is that geoculture means that people in power had to figure out a way of how to respond to this pressure also intellectually. And this is where intellectuals come in handy. And this is the birth of modern intellectuals, but also of modern ideologists and, of course, of social sciences. So the greatest novelty, according to Emmanuel, of uh, French Revolution was that it created the idea that social change is normal, social change is desirable, but social change needs to be somehow managed and controlled. And the forum through which social change can be enacted and uh, experimented with is the state. So what capitalist modernity means, basically, is the organization of the world in which centrist liberalism, 
occupies a central and most dominant place. However, the part of the whole world of capitalist modernity is not only occupied by the dominant geoculture of centrist liberalism, but also by other modernist ideologies that are also part of capitalism. And these are, of course, modern conservatism, but also the dominant uh, mainstream forms of Marxism. They all deployed and accepted the liberal notion of time, which is the linear notion of time, a progressivist notion of time, unquestioned belief in the idea of progress, linear temporality, and organization of space through nation states and through a political system of representative democracy, identified again with the space, geographic space of the state, with the dominant nationality and ethnic group and dominant language. Now, many of us began to call this a Jacobin solution, and Daniel Guerin has this famous and beautiful essay, The Jacobinized Revolution, perhaps, would be translation from French. I'm not entirely sure if this has been published in English. And... Uh, the idea basically is that the Jacobin revolution had and Jacobin temporality and Jacobin idea of the state and Jacobin idea of modernity had only one enemy, and that enemy was anarchism. Anarchism was anti-foundationalist in a sense that it refused to accept all the foundational elements of capitalist modernity. Authority of the state, authority of the nation, modern nation, authority of liberalism, and authority of the intellectual. So what uh, people in power did in order to manage social change, they invented uh, the university. University was a moribund institution, medieval university, of course, before the 18th century, when it was reinvented very carefully. And eventually, 19th century, the disciplines were created. And all of this was a political enterprise. This was an attempt to, again, manage and explain social change. So you had all of a sudden social sciences created with a particular political task. The first one that was transformed into science was actually history. And the reason why history was uh, created was basically to respond to the challenges of Paris Commune of 1871. And then history, especially with Leopold Ranke, who said famously that uh, we have to study the history, the past, as it really happened, became really a history that, a, a form of science that legitimizes the state and legitimizes the nation. And when I say legitimizes, I also mean to a certain extent create the state and create the nation. Historians, the new historians, professional historians, Ranke and others, were actually given a task to create states and nations. Two states were already brought into life. Now we had to invent, as the famous saying goes, we have France, now we have to invent French people. And for this, we needed history. So history was given that particular task. Liberal ideology is organized around the trinity of concepts. It's organized around a very violent abstractions. One is called the state, another is called the economy or the market, and the last one is society. Society was left to the sociologists. Sociologists were there to study the society. Economists were invented in order to study the market. And finally, political science and political scientists were created in order to study the state. Those people who were left behind the liberal political universe were known as primitives, you know, people who don't really have the state. So the stateless population of savages, barbarians, primitives were a domain of a new discipline, social science discipline, known as anthropology. And finally, we have people who once upon a time used to have great empires, great cultures and great civilizations, and like people in Persia, like people in China, and they became the domain, the field of study of Orientalists, people who were mostly philologists, but who were using all sides, all ways of uh, 
studying different cultures that are supposedly frozen in time, meaning that they do not belong to the world of Eurocentric liberal modernity. And again, most of the ideas, most of the ideologies against centrist liberalism, uh, what Emmanuel Bolestin calls anti-systemic movements, movements against the system, were very much embedded in that system because they accepted the same premise of progress, of a certain unqualified celebration of the Enlightenment, of certain ideas of the Enlightenment codified by the states. And uh, there was only one that was misfitting, and that was anarchism. So what World Systems does for me in terms of understanding anarchism, it opens up a space to speak about two periods in the history of anarchism. The first one is what I call the first anarchist century. And that is, I would say, roughly between 1870s and either 1917 or 1936, the Spanish Revolution, depending on when you want to think about the end of the first anarchist century, which was the period, and this is the reason why I'm calling it the anarchist century, is the period when anarchism was the dominant perspective in the global south, and in basically all the countries except uh, Western Europe. In Western Europe, you had the absolute triumph predominance of hegemonic Marxism, which was the Marxism of the Second International, the Marxism of the steam engine and Marxism of the guillotine, which was developed by people in German social democracy and later on improved upon in certain sense <laughs> By, by Lenin and his comrades. You had few dissonant voices like Rosa Luxemburg and uh, like people who became known as council communists and libertarian Marxists, but they were a minority. In most of the world, the dominant anti-capitalist tradition was tradition of anarchism. And you can read Benedict Anderson's wonderful book called Under Three Flags, Anarchism and Anti-Colonial Imagination, Shoko Nishi's masterful work on anarchist, uh, anarchist modernity, and of course Ilhan Kari Kuri Magdisi, who is from Lebanon, and her work on global radicalism in Eastern Mediterranean. And in all of these books and many others who are treating anarchism from this perspective, you could see that this period, 1870s to Russian Revolution, or perhaps to Spanish Revolution, was a period where anarchism was really the only game in town in terms of anti-capitalist politics. It served as a sort of gravitational force between uh, revolutionary and anti-colonial struggles on different sides of the Atlantic. So you had this incredible situations in which Filipino nationalists, meaning anti-colonial fighters, would meet anarchists and exchange ideas, would borrow from anarchist repertoire of anarchist ideas, which was very flexible because anarchism was always gave more uh, primacy to life than to the text. So this anti-authoritarian eclecticism of anarchists was something that the anti-colonial revolutionaries in India, in the Philippines, in Japan, in China were all using for different purposes. There were a series of communication network, which involved many, many different journals from Belgrade to New Jersey. The most important one was in Paris. Uh, Le Temps Nouveau, and uh, all of these journals were a sort of a communication network of that anarchist century. But there were also other spaces. Anarchists were absolutely brilliant in using the new public spaces like taverns, cafes, but also theaters to propagate anarchism, and of course schools. This is the beginning of modern school movement with Francisco Ferrer. But anarchism actually, in terms of education, begins with Paul Hoban, who is an anarchist who created the first educational program for the Paris Commune, and the only one, known as Integral Education. So integral education, and you will notice that a place where I teach is called California Institute of Integral Studies. Integral education is, uh, for a long time, was the anarchist perspective on education. 
Tolstoy, who was very close to anarchism, was uh, very close to all of these. They were known as model schools that were created all over, not only Europe, but the entire world, because anarchists organized through networks. And network was a preferred model of anarchist organizing in, the, in those days. So Pietro Gori, Vico Malatesta, you know, the fabled names of European anarchism, were all of a sudden in Paraguay and Argentina. And there is a reason why. There was a very intimate connection between Caribbean, Pacific, Mediterranean networks where anarchists were circulating their ideas. We know that uh, of translations of Malatesta in Cuba, we know of Malatesta, for example, trying to come to my parts of the world, the Balkans, to fight against the Ottomans. In, uh, in the late 19th century. We know that he was with Stepniak, who was a famous Russian populist. After that, they're going and they're uh, plundering the, the countryside of uh, Italy, uh, repurposing, or I guess the term would be expropriating many of the properties, village properties there. Stepniak then goes to Russia, assassinates the minister of the police comes back to England. He is killed, unfortunately, in Chiswick, I think, of all places, in a train accident. So this is a you know time where anarchism is traveling everywhere. Francisco Ferrer is a famous anarchist educator, was murdered by the state in 1908. His project, which is known as Modern Schools and Modern School Movement, becomes uh, extremely popular. And you, in the United States, you had Modern School Movement and many modern schools. But Francisco Fer Ferrer Affair, as it was known, became a play. Uh, they used to be known as Martyr Plays. And this play was uh, a theater play. It was play was, uh, I think, premiered in Alexandria or in Beirut. I can't remember. And then later in Buenos Aires. And then, of course, you had Ferrer Affair and you had the May Day. Immigrant anarchists who uh, created the May Day. And uh, who, I guess, two, those two events are really kind of the connective tissue or the most celebrated events of the anarchist century. Marx was important. Anarchists were very much, and I would say that anarchists in many ways were more faithful to Marx than majority of the so-called hegemonic Marxism or the mainstream or right-wing Marxism, as I call it. Uh, but uh, Bakunin famously translated in prison Marx's capital. But Mar anarchists were always skeptical of Marxism because Marxism was a modernist ideology. Marxists, majority of Marxists in those days, were people who were tinkering with engineering, soul engineering, and engineering of idea of creating the great locomotives of the future, fascinating with tractors and modernist progress. Anarchists were always skeptical. Anarchists were thinking about uh, Russian Mir and different other forms of organization, self-organization of people in Russia as not as uh, pre-capitalist in terms of a relic of the past, but as non-capitalist in terms of traditional forms that, again, to some extent, deform and avoid capitalist relations. And I believe very firmly that Marx, at the end of his life, the most libertarian Marx, was the Marx who wrote to Vera Zasulich, famous Russian uh, Russian populist, and who basically agreed that there is nothing inevitable about capitalism. However, Marx was not always read by the Marxists. And again, I think that anarchists and later feminists developed some of the most important and libertarian insights of Marx and understood that Marx is far more complicated than it is presented by the orthodox Marxist doctrine. So, all of this is possible to understand if you think about both systems. You think about the first anarchist century, which ends with the triumph of state socialism. And it basically ends with, and this is how Emmanuel Wollaston explains it. He says, well, before, during the anarchist century, he doesn't use those terms, I do, but during the, the time of anarchist dominance in the capitalist world system as an anti-systemic uh, configuration of ideas. There was a two-step strategy that people accepted. 
which is first you change the society, you create new possibilities, you create new social relations, you create a new civilization, basically, outside and against capitalist modernity. And then you destroy or you replace or you dissolve the state in those relationships. Two-step strategy became reversed with the Russian Revolution. And it was first take the power of the state, then create a new socialist humanity. And that two-step strategy was felt all over the world. Dominance and overwhelming acceptance by the radicals of that two-step strategy is part of what we can call Marxist century, which in my analysis leads to 1968, the time that world systems theorists called the world revolution of 1968, that simultaneously exploded in many different places, and that basically questioned that fundamental premise of anti-systemic movements, which is that you have to first conquer the state, take the power, and then create a new society. And what was created instead was basically a validation of the anarchist, old anarchist insight, that you have to do it exactly the other way around, this was formulated in sort of clumsy way with the new left movements and new left political culture following the 1968 World Revolution, so in the 70s. But finally, after the 1989, 1990s, the end of Soviet Union, you have, I think, the you can recognize the first symptoms of the triumph of all of those ideas that anarchists traditionally championed. And David Graeber and myself wrote an essay, I believe sometime in the 90s, about anarchism or the new revolutionary movement of the 20th, 21st century, I think it was the name of that essay, that had an interesting career and it's still being read and widely disputed and, you know, but basic, the basic idea that we had is that after this period, after the Marxist century, the new anarchist century, the second anarchist century is coming in a sense of the anarchism, which is insurgent common sense, as we defined it in, in the article, insisting on the ideas of self-organization, self-management, direct democracy, libertarian socialism, all of these ideas were becoming dominant and again a sense of a, a sort of a common sense in politics that we could see in Mexico, in other parts of Latin America, in Europe, in the United States. Anti-globalization movement was profoundly, I think, influenced by this libertarian impulse, as was the Occupy movement. So right now, I think we have this uncomfortable situation in which I can see the pernicious and sort of frightening resurgence of statist bureaucratic socialist ideas and people who should be truly ashamed for peddling this nonsense, who are again, once again, trying to bring the state in and who are trying to reinvent or somehow this cadaver of of bureaucratic socialism in this necrophiliac maneuver to make us again read all the people whom we should really not read anymore. Is it Bernstein or is it Kautsky? Is it Lenin or is it Trotsky or is it, God forbid, Stalin? All of these ghosts from the demons from the past are now being summoned in order to make an argument that we need to be realistic and we need to demand the possible, and the possible seems to be, again, and this is just such a colossal failure of imagination, but also any kind of historical nerve, is a resurrection of state bureaucratic socialism, because we supposedly have no choice but to, again, commit a suicide in terms of radical politics. So I think the great challenge for the new generation of radicals is to refuse any, and I mean any, idea, political idea associated with the state.
and to say farewell to the ideas and traditions of capitalist modernity and to look at places like Rojava and places like Chapas, but also so many other places where libertarian ideas have been practiced and have been improved upon, improvised and so forth. And there is a reason why ideas of full systems theorists like Emmanuel Wallerstein, Giovanni Arrighi and many others actually read in Rojava. If you read Rojava, the Kurdish part of Syria, which is now the part of uh, experiencing a libertarian social revolution, well, the most important person is Murray Bookchin, an anarchist from the United States, and the other most important reference are is Emmanuel Wallerstein and Fernand Brodel. Same with Chiapas. But you have, when you go to Chiapas, you will be escorted to Emmanuel Wallerstein Library. So there is a reason why these theorists are actually being recognized as people who have something interesting to say to the movements that are perhaps the most significant movements of our time. So all of this is a very long question, a very long answer to your question that both systems analysis, in my view, offers to people who identify with anarchism and libertarian Marxism, what we can call libertarian socialism or libertarian communism, a lot of space to rework politics in a way of understanding the world that is not the world of nation states. And the main premise of world systems is that we live in a singular historical system organized by axial division of labor. There is a periphery, there is a core, there is perhaps something called semi-periphery. The way that this, the world is organized through the division of labor, through the world market, and through the interstate system. And in a certain sense, it is a direct assault against the usual nationalism of conventional social science that fetishizes the nation state as the main unit of analysis. In world systems, it's exactly the opposite. The main unit of analysis is capitalist modernity, capitalist world economy, modern world system, or now there is a new interpretation, capitalist world ecology, associated with the work of Jason Moore and his school, meaning there is a historical system in which states are nothing but instances of political organization. And we should study the way that different instances are being produced within historical space that we call capitalist world system or capitalist world ecology. And we should not fetishize the state as a unit of analysis. We should try to study them and understand them, but they should not be our unit of analysis. I think it's really interesting that the two examples that you brought up of some of the revolutions that are currently going on, they both sprung out of, to some degree, an initial Marxist impulse, whether it be the, like, I think, Stalinist at the time, PKK, that went through the changes after the fall of the Soviet Union. And, and as you said, like, you know, brought in ideas from Brodel and from Bookchin, from Wallerstein, from many other people, as well as studying what was happening in Chiapas. And then what was happening in Chiapas, Marxist guerrillas going into the forest and into the jungle and intermeshing and building something new with Mayan people in the state of Chiapas. And the synthesis that comes out, the unorthodox, like like largely indigenous answer to neoliberal capitalism that has been created in both of those instances, while like distinctive of each other, there's a lot of resonance between them. And I think that the fact that the impulse was directed by indigenous folks, not to say that indigenous folks aren't a lot of different things, not to say it's a monolithic thing, but the fact that it's such a break with this like modernist progressive worldview that these other systems that, you know, academia has been pushing and that the states have been pushing. It provides something that an example that says it's not you know, like it moves from this state and stage of development into this stage. And those people are back here. It's, you know, it, it is what people make it. Does that make sense? Sorry, that was kind of rambly. <laughs> 
No, not at all. I think it absolutely makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I'm right now writing an introduction to Ojalan's book called The Beyond Power, State and Violence, which is going to be published very soon. And it's a huge book. It's a, it has 700 pages, I think. And uh, the book was fascinating because he has all of these. It follows him changing from person who might be called an uh, old leftist, Stalinist, Maoist, probably closest to Maoism, and, uh, you know, p- person who believes in statism and national liberation. And he does this thing that Maoist often calls critique, self-critique. And he does this in such a way that you see that he responding to the analysis made by Wallerstein and others, but also, and Bookchin, of course, but also responding to his own experience. He now imprisoned in the uh, prison on the island of Imrali in Turkey, he is able to completely reinvent and uh, <laughs> create a completely different different system that is profoundly libertarian you know and i'm reading this book and i'm reading his you know it's it's a fascinating book because he speaks about his curious marriages as he calls them about his relationship with his brother his love of the mountains and at the same time he speaks he criticizes analytical intelligence and uh, the lack of dialectical method employed by many marxists and gives this masterful overview of Kurdish and, and Ottoman and Turkish, modern Turkish history. It's a, just an incredible book, but you can see how incredibly difficult it must be for somebody to change and then to enact a change or to participate in this enactment of change in uh, the entire movement, which is huge. I mean, Kurdish freedom movement is probably the most numerous leftist, in terms of numbers at least, uh, leftist force that I can think of right now. And all of these people are now identified with a form of libertarian thinking, inspired, maybe formulated by Ojalan in prison. So it, it, it's, it's a mind-boggling experience just observing this. And David Graeber and myself have become uh, acquainted with this experience in 2012, not without some initial skepticism. We were at the beginning, as two anarchists, uh, very confused by this change and somewhat skeptical. And it took us several trips to Rojava to actually be able to see that this is real that this is not for show, that this, and then, of course, delving into all of this literature and reading um, Audreland's books, and even more importantly, meeting Kurdish activists internationally, but also in Rojava and other places uh, in the Middle East, was absolutely profoundly uh, enlightening experience. This was the first time, and I think I told you, again, my grandparents have witnessed a revolution. They believed in the idea that revolution is possible, that social change is possible. And I came of age at the time when people, mostly intellectuals, were saying that no such thing is possible anymore. We have to have to stop having these great dreams, imperial Napoleonic dreams of great change. And we need to think about whatever, lifestyles and different other kinds of impossibility of thinking about revolution. It became codified in certain forms of post-structuralism and other intellectual interventions that were you know, very popular, that all discounted generosity, altruism, mutual aid, and revolution. And then coming to Rojava and seeing what's happening there, I actually experienced firsthand what it means to be a part of a social revolution, of a revolutionary transformation of the entire society on the basis of a non-state democracy. Democracy that is, as any democracy, uh, democracy cannot be compatible with the state. You either have the state, a representative government, or you have a democracy. You can have both at the same time. So we are seeing a non-state space emerging there in the middle of a very complicated, confusing, contradictory social revolution in which uh, revolution once again becomes possible. 
And I think this is very important. And I think that we should think about this and think about this incredible strength and courage that it took the Kurdish revolutionary movement to transform from a sclerotic, uh, statist organization to respond to the challenges and promises and perspectives of the new moment of the new anarchist century and to reinvent themselves and give us what is now probably the most impressive example of revolutionary uprising or revolutionary restructuring of a society that refuses to become a state anywhere. So I think that also confirms certain insights of world systems tradition. And um, I don't know how interested you are in, in my own way of dealing with it. You know, I told you that <laughs> when I went to Fernand Brodel Center, I was not exactly friendly disposed to Fernand Brodel, which was somewhat uncomfortable. As you can imagine, I was looking into histories from below and, and then, you know, through my exchanges with, especially with Dale Tomic, I understood that world systems is by no means a coherent set of things. World systems can be understood as a theory, which some people unfortunately do, which I think is a big mistake, or as a method, which is far more interesting way to think about world systems. And uh, it also led me to understand Marx in a different way. And it took me back to Marx, but not the Marx from my high school or my college uh, or my university. Um, different kind of Marx. Marx who actually, uh, let's say, a kind of a unusual, and I mentioned at the beginning, Karel Kosick and his book, Dialectics of the Concrete, which influenced me deeply. Marx who actually opens up space for thinking together with Brodel, thinking about history in a much more layered and complex ways, opening up space for new temporalities that are different, antagonistic temporalities to the dominant temporality sense of time uh, of liberal modernity and capitalist modernity. It allowed me to grasp the Zapatistas and um, the Kurds not as some kind of a pre-capitalist relic, Again, not as people who belong in some kind of non-modern past who need to be modernized, but to a group of people, uh, to, to examples of this distinct antagonistic temporality that Kurds uh, have a term for this, inhabit democratic modernity, a different kind of modernity, a different kind of temporality that can only be understood if we employ a very non-conventional social science. And that led me to um, this uh, interesting, I think, or weird perhaps, way of combining Hegelian Marxism, anarchist anthropology, and uh, Brodelian history as a way of understanding what both systems is and both systems analysis could be. And again, uh, to conclude with this, perhaps, and with this, with this, uh, as a response to this question of yours, uh, I think this is also something that has very significant political consequences, including for the country or to the region that I come from. I introduce myself as somebody who is a, not only a Yugoslav but a Balkan federalist. And when you think about the notions of federalism and regional organization, the principles of non-statist uh, federalism, well, that's exactly what is coming out of uh, Kurdistan right now, is the, the idea of democratic confederalism. And I think that people in the Balkans should be in dialogue with these ideas. And I think this is definitely where my politics or political energy goes these days to create these possibilities of political translation in which the ideas of federalism that of course look different in Kurdistan and in the Balkans and the possibilities of these federalist ideas in other parts of the world can be somehow placed in a dialogue. And we can actually learn from all of these experiences and struggle for what was for a long time a signature accomplishment of anarchism, which is anti-authoritarian federalist political idea and self-management as a way of organizing society.
Uh, I've I've had you on for a long time, and I would love to continue talking. I I think I just have time for one more question, if that if you don't mind. But I'd love to talk again sometime in the future. So, you've brought up David Graeber a couple times in anarchist anthropology, and 2020 saw the passage of your friend and colleague, anarchist anthropologist, activist, author, and professor David Graeber from this mortal coil. I feel like a lot of the impacts that he had on liberatory movements haven't yet been measured. And I wonder if you'd say some words about your relationship and what of his works left their mark on you most, um, and if you have any suggested starting places for people that aren't familiar with uh, with his writings and contributions. Yes, well, David was my best friend since the end of the nineties until his passing in in uh, September, oh, a year and something ago. Uh, so it was. Uh, probably the greatest loss of my life and uh, somebody who I profoundly mourn and miss every day. And uh, David was not just the best friend, just not only a best friend, but also a political companion. And I don't think I've ever had an idea that I did not run by him first. Uh, We used to talk on the phone every day. We used to meet to discuss these things and and it's hard for me to talk about david but uh, it's also important i think to talk about david because david is uh, should be celebrated as uh, to my mind the most original anarchist thinker of contemporary period and also a brilliant anthropologist what is he distinguished? Uh, well, he's distinguished by his, first of all, his contribution to anthropology has been immense. And I think people are going to spend a lot of time assessing his contribution to anthropology and other historical social sciences. He was absolutely, <laughs> he was not troubled by trends in anthropology. He was actually quite traditional in his taste in terms of anthropology, and he wanted anthropology to go back, not to its colonial roots, of course, but to what made anthropology so rich. And that is the idea that anthropology could be understood as a catalog of political possibilities. And possibility was a key word for David, and perhaps the first book that I would recommend to people to read, a collection called Possibilities, published by AK Press, sometimes in, I think, 2008. And uh, that book contains all the germs of the ideas that David will continue to explore and that coalesce around the idea of a dialogue. David believed in dialogue, something that he called dialogical relativism or dialogical anthropology and also dialogical politics. He believed, for example, that anarchism is more than anything else premised or made possible by the idea of dialogue. Anarchism is profoundly dialogical. We come together because we want to solve a particular problem. And then we talk about it. We don't first define social reality, and then we have all to agree about what social reality, political reality, and so forth is, devise a correct line, and then proceed from there. That is the political horizon of orthodox Marxism. His idea was that anarchism was a situation in which we have a particular problem that we have to solve, and people who might have completely different ways of what the world is like, come together to figure out how to solve that problem, out of which he developed something that he calls low theory, which is different than high theory. And low theory is the way of grappling with all of these consequences of of, uh, practical political project. So anarchism in that sense is profoundly dialogical, And anarchist anthropology, which is the term that David has been associated with, which is elucidated in his pamphlet, Fragments of Anarchist Anthropology, published in 2001, a brilliant piece of work, but pamphlet, is something that I have tried, and I think this is my way of honoring David, to um, build in my department. I was invited to California Institute of Integral Studies in 2012 to build a department uh, 
and they asked me what kind of department you would like to build. And I said, well, I would like to create a department of anarchist anthropology. And I really thought that they were just going to throw me out of the room or maybe through the window. But I actually said, yes, okay. And one of the reasons was that David made anarchist anthropology something that people were able to refer to and understand as something that is actually valuable. So one of the ways that he spoke about anarchist anthropology is... Uh, suspended dialogue between or a dial active dialogue between ethnographic research and possible utopias or utopian possibilities so ethnographic research into utopian possibilities places experiences cracks that are created in the here and now and that already exist and then using all the gifts and possibilities of offered by the technique of ethnography to actually study those people, those practices, and those spaces is what makes anthropology anarchist. And he, this is what we do at the Anthropology and Social Change at California Institute of Integral Studies. We try to use ethnography and by ethnography, I mean militant ethnography, militant research, activist ethnography, in order to study these utopian possibilities. And again, for David, anthropology was study of human possibilities, showing people, showing the audience, showing his readers, that anthropology, or oh, that uh, humanity and uh, possibilities are always much larger than we are led to believe and discovering them and bringing them to light, emphasizing them, preventing them from uh, shielding them, as E.P. Thompson said, from the condescension of posterity is something that anthropologists should be doing and anthropologists should be, and at its best, it's all about enlarging that sense of political possibility. So David, as a political theorist, I hesitate to call him that, uh, as a polit uh, David as somebody, as an anarchist intellectual, is somebody who has inspired anarchism by pushing us to think about anarchism not as a dead set of ideas, as something that's sclerotic and belongs to 19 or early 20th century, but something that continues to develop. And he recognized social sciences, anthropology in particular, but social sciences more generally, as an important vehicle in expressing anarchist ideas and developing anarchist insights. So David as an anthropologist and David as a political anarchist, usually people talk about them in a separation. I think that's a mistake. I think that David was, he was one of the most serious and dedicated anarchists I have ever met. And he is definitely the most brilliant social scientist that I was lucky to meet, privileged to meet and called a friend. And he is someone who was able to show us a way that social science need not to be neutral or uh, anarchist have nothing to be ashamed of. There is no intellectual deficit inherent in the tradition of anarchism. Quite on the contrary. Anarchism can be used in a way that is profoundly intellectual. And he defied those foundational principles of modernity, capitalist modernity I talked about, in such a vigorous, intelligent, and creative way that it's hard for me to find words. The loss is immeasurable, but the books that he left us uh, including The Dawn of Everything, which we co-authored with his friend David Rangrell, are absolutely breathtaking in the ambition, scope, and consequences for thinking about world history. And David used to say that he thinks about the past and writes about the past because people who write history write about the past in a way that it hides, obscures the possibilities, in a way that it prevents it to be written, in a way that prevents us to think about the future. So he was very interested in finding a way of writing about the past so a new kind of future and possibilities would be revealed. And I think that in doing this, he was remarkably successful.
So you're quite right. His political legacy and intellectual legacy, the two of which cannot be separated, is something that's going to be rediscovered and celebrated, I'm sure, many, many decades from now. And perhaps to end with this, he was just uh, one of the most joyful, one of the most generous, and one of the most dedicated people I've ever met in my life. Thank you very much for sharing that, Andre. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. I've learned a lot. I'm very excited to share this with the audience. In closing, I guess, we mentioned the Journal of World Systems Research, where people can find your editorial work. Where else can listeners find some of your books or if you have a blog or anything like that, aside from the journal? Well, one thing that I do is I am one of the people involved with PM Press publishing and it's a project that i care a lot about and it is uh, thanks to another brilliant and exceptional person whose name is ramsey canan and a group of people that he that he brought together we have a publisher that is uh, that exemplifies i think all that it's best in thinking about anarchism and radical politics today and with uh, PM Press, I am an editor of an imprint or a, a series editor, I guess, called Kairos. The term is taken from Emmanuel Wallerstein and the way that he uses the term Kairos, which means the right moment. The idea that this being right now is the right moment to think about social change, right? So Kairos is an imprint of... Uh, PM Press, and the people can go to PM Press website and see Kairos and see the books that we publish with Kairos. And of course, there is a blog or there is a there is a page that I have there that is part of the PM Press website. And of course, California uh, California Institute of Integral Studies, Department of Anthropology and Social Change. We also publish things there. And is Kairos where people can hope to see the translation of Ojalan's work that you're doing the introduction for? Yes. So Kairos is where we have published so far, I think, four books by Ojalan and at least two or three books about the Kurdish freedom movement and the Rojava revolution. I edited all of them, and I think these are really important documents for understanding what is happening with the Kurdish freedom movement and struggles in Rojava in particular. Again, thank you so much for taking the time and for all the work that you that you do. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. And just a quick content warning, this segment includes some mentions of suicide. So uh, listener discretion is advised. Lauren spent the holidays in New Mexico with my mom. So they could do some bonding and learn to take on each other's sides in any dispute involving me. Yeah, that's wonderful. But in the process, Lauren got to meet some good friends of my parents. Jack and Amy. Jack and Amy are really exceptional people who love my mom and dad like their own parents and have been there vigilantly for my mom ever since my dad died in March of 2020. Jack taught Lauren how to shoot and Lauren fired a gun for the first time. That's important for when I get out so we can go on a bank robbing spree like Bonnie and Clyde in an old car with running boards and suicide doors or if there's a zombie apocalypse. Headshots, Lauren. Headshots. Returning to Ohio, Lauren made some art that's now posted on Instagram at Swaniac 1969 featuring a burning American flag upside down with the words, burn the state, melt the ice. Ice meaning the immigration service, not the polar cat. Jack and Amy saw the post and were hurt. They didn't make a big deal of it because that's not who they are, but they mentioned it to my mom. Jack is a combat vet who suffers post-traumatic stress and a variety of health problems that are, I suspect, linked to his time in combat theaters. To Jack, he has sacrificed a lot for that flag, and it sincerely hurt him to see it defaced by Lauren, especially because Lauren matters to him and Amy. Amy. 
talking with Lauren, I know we both feel bad that Jack and Amy were hurt. And we didn't intend for them to feel that way. And we wish they weren't hurt. And so, for me, this became a situation to ponder how to articulate a response that is both a fair acknowledgement of their feelings, an expression of sorrow for their pain, and an explanation in defense of flag burning. I'm reminded of the words of a drill sergeant I knew when I was in the Army. He was talking about soldiers who suffered torture as prisoners of war because they refused to wipe their feet on the flag. He said, if I never captured in order to wipe my feet on the flag, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to wipe my feet on the flag. It's just a piece of cloth. And he's right. It's a piece of cloth. But it clearly means a lot more than that to many people. And it means different things to different people. Last January, for instance, rioters waved American flags while storming a building under an American flag. And they attacked cops who had American flags in the sleeves of their uniforms. It seems that sometimes one person's sense of the meaning of the flag punches someone else's sense of the meaning of the flag right in the face. So it's not just a piece of cloth, it's a symbol. And we invest that symbol with certain values. For Jack and Amy, perhaps that flag represents freedom and a geographic space they call home and a refuge for those they love and a hope to spread opportunity and liberty to others. Those are the values they may invest in that flag. It says something about them as people. Lauren and I see a symbol of some very different values. We see a symbol of hypocrisy. Talking about freedom while gunning down unarmed black men, restricting voting rights, attacking women's reproductive rights and closing clinics that serve poor women invading other countries in the interests of powerful corporations. We see a symbol not just of a land and a people, but a symbol of a government. A government that deliberately bombed water treatment facilities to kill children in Iraq, leading to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of kids under the age of six. It went on for a decade. It's a government that uses depleted uranium in its conventional munitions, radiating even its own troops who come home sick. It's a government that approved torture, not just of enemy combatants, but of its own people whose politics make the government uncomfortable. Me. Guantanamo Bay is still open, and the U.S. holds a higher percentage of its own population in prison than any country in the history of humanity, making it objectively the most unfree country in history. When you look around the world and see folks burning flags, you don't normally see them burning the flags of Belgium or France, Bangladesh or Algeria. They're burning the flags of the United States and maybe of Israel. I don't think it's because everyone in the world is unreasonable or that they're jealous of us. I think they've been hurt by the United States, just like the millions starving now in Afghanistan. No one is hurt more by the United States than its own veterans. A friend of mine who had to check himself into the VA hospital for mental health observation described to me how a friend of his went to the VA feeling suicidal and was denied admission. He killed himself hours later. Another veteran told by his VA psychiatrist that he did not need admitted dove out of the psychiatrist's office window falling three stories to his death. If this is the best that the U.S. government can do, perhaps it should at least move its shrink's offices to the ground floor. So, just as a flag is a symbol, so is the burning or defacing of that flag. It's a way to send an important message to those who do not uphold the values of people like Jack and Amy, but exploit them for profit. We do not buy into their program. We burn flags because once they are emptied of their true value, there's no reason to keep them. We burn flags in the hope of a future world different than this one, where lives, including Jack's and Amy's, will matter more than a piece of cloth. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max.
in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. The state of Ohio seems to be stalling in the process of interstate transfer of Sean away from his spouse, lawyer, and main support base, which is good news. Please check the show notes for more details on how to support his struggle to stay in Ohio. You can also still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain, number A243205, OSP Youngstown, 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road, Youngstown, Ohio, 44505. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. Psst. You can cash app dollar sign Swainiac 1969 or send Dota to us and comment that it's for Swain's defense. More info is also available on Instagram at at Swainiac 1969 or Twitter at at Swain Rocks. If you appreciate the work that we do here at the Final Straw and want to support us, rate us and review us on those online streaming sites, Google, Apple, whatever, Stitcher. Uh, you can also share our content in real life or on social media. That's super helpful. Getting us into other people, new people's ears is wonderful. You can suggest content to us. You can give us uh, feedback on our episodes you can print out some of the zines that are up on our zines tab and share them with people ideally sharing them with prisoners is great because getting up-to-date conversations on radical themes into prisons is kind of a difficult thing so we're happy to provide content for that you can translate our work if you speak another language any of our transcripts are up online for free and we would love to see that happen you can also rebroadcast us just let us know that you're doing so so that we can brag about it uh if you have money that you want to send our way we totally appreciate it the majority of the money that we get goes to fund the transcription services that we have as well as our syndication costs so uh, you can find more about how to donate at tfsr.wtf slash support, where you can subscribe to us on Patreon, or you can send us money through PayPal or through Venmo or LiberoPay. And finally, if you want to hear us up on your local radio station and you have an independent radio station or community radio station in your area or a college station or whatever, go ahead and reach out to us or check out tfsr.wtf slash radio where there's more information there and reach out to the station let them know you want to hear us on the airwaves we have an fcc friendly 58 minute episode that we produce weekly and have been for a number of years we're syndicated on about a dozen stations around the country around the so-called u.s and would love to reach more audiences thank you so much this is The Final Straw. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.